Are you feeling anxious from the beep, beep, beep of your phone as notification after whistle after click after bing trigger on and on into the wee hours of the morning? Are you wondering why you can't sleep? Welcome, hunter-gatherer, to the 21st century. In today's book, evolutionary biologists Brett Weinstein and Heather Hying take us on a journey through all facets of our modern world and point out how our evolutionary traits are being gamed and undermined and what we can do to fix this. So get ready to put down your phone and get some sleep. This one will get your monkey brain humming. The book. Most of the source material for these ideas comes from the book A Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century by Brett Weinstein and Heather Hying. These musings will call out some of the highlights and actionable takeaways in a soothing format that will enable that strung-out accountant on the ledge screaming at the bin chickens a moment to pause, a moment to consider his evolutionary roots and to say to himself, maybe I don't have to live this way. But why this book? So why should you give a damn about what your evolutionary ancestors were like? They are dead, so they can't be that clever. Well, what if I'd said that by reviewing the issues of your life through an evolutionary lens, you could start having a new appreciation for the complex and unique individual that you are and start making some real progress on addressing the fact that you behave like a 40-year-old man-child? The book itself backs up the wisdom offered with many great examples from the natural world. It is endlessly fascinating to read about how the selection mechanism of evolution solved problems and managed trade-offs. The authors have ventured into faraway lands to conduct their scientific research and the book is richly detailed with what they have learned. If you find this humble sketch interesting, please go get the book and start putting some of their ideas into practice. It is worth your time. We'll split this one up into three posts because there is a lot to get into. Here we go. You've found the Self as Lab podcast. My name is David Hart. Opening scene. Never before in history has it been possible to believe that you are a local but be absolutely lacking in the fundamental knowledge of a place that will keep you safe during a rare natural event. We no longer have close ties with the community. We don't stay anywhere for long enough to truly understand the environment. We transit all over the world and we are now relying on increasingly complex global systems, far too complex for any one person to fully understand. The modern world presents the illusion of safety. Food is modified to trick our evolutionary systems into consuming more and more processed foods. The medical system is geared towards treating the human body as a machine resulting in unnecessary medical procedures and medication. Economic downturns crush the poorest of society as the weakness of our community bonds are exposed and violence and anarchy lurk one poorly crafted tweet away. Technology has accelerated at such a pace that our entire reality is now a hyper-novel experience. Humans are incredible at being able to adapt, but the rate of change is so rapid that our brains, bodies and societies cannot keep up. The human niche. We are not in control of nature and can never be. To course correct from our current dangerous path, we need to understand our true nature and how to offset the tendencies driving what we are now doing. Species are defined by their niche, their niche being the way they interact with and survive in their environment. As humans evolved, we appeared to be the jack of all trades and master of none. Where required, smaller groups could specialise, dominating newfound niches. When we would run up against the boundary of a niche, we immediately would test it, trying to break out of the current pattern. In this sense, we are exceptional at being exceptional. We have the competitive advantage of being specialists without sacrificing breadth. Campfire. It's hard to overestimate how important fire was to early humans. It provided light, warmth, increased the nutritional value of food and kept predators at bay. It could transform landscapes and sculpt and harden materials for us. It was also the forge for ideas. It is where we shared experiences, discussed failures and celebrated successes. From this, the ideas emerged that have made us a super species. 
To survive and thrive in the environment, humans need the connection to people, sharing ideas and working on problems together. We need many people plugging in and parallel processing. These connections transcend our individual limitations and make us phenomenal problem solvers. This process was repeated night after night for thousands of years around campfires. A problem would be brought to consciousness, different ideas presented and argued over, solutions verified and discussed. Successful solutions would be turned into habit, then traditions and eventually culture to be transmitted across space and time. Campfires have for the longest time been a convergence point for culture and consciousness. Culture and Consciousness Consciousness, as defined here, is taken to be that chunk of cognition that is packaged for exchange. Consciousness is great for problem solving, but bad for execution. It gets in the way of complex tasks. When someone is in the zone, consciousness becomes an observer. Consider a great pianist playing a complicated piece that has taken many months to learn. The learning is to make automatic the patterns, make them habit, and stop the conscious part of ourselves from interrupting and slowing things down. Culture is the beliefs and practices that are shared and passed between members of a population. They can be literally false but metaphorically true and continue to get disseminated if it improves fitness. Culture can be passed horizontally rather than genetically. It can spread fast and is very noisy. What lasts, the signal, gets passed vertically as wisdom. Humans switch between these two dominant modes. When we are faced with a problem for which our prior understanding is inadequate, we become conscious. Once the problem is solved, it gets turned into routine and absorbed into habit and culture, a process to run in the background. The implication is that when times are good, we shouldn't change culture. In times of stability, culture reigns. If things are going poorly, they'll be brought to our conscious attention and we should consider taking risks and looking to change. In times of expansion, consciousness reigns. There is a tension between conforming and disagreeing in the face of inconsistency, between wisdom and innovation, culture and consciousness. As things accelerate, the cultural wisdom isn't sufficient and we need to innovate as individuals. The problem is it is so hard to figure out in our modern times if things are going well. There is so much noise every day in our hypernovel world. How do we find the signal? So what is the human niche? Amazingly, the human niche is actually niche switching. We manage to escape the paradigm by mastering a different game. We are capable of loading all sorts of software packages into our plastic brains and adapting to wildly different environments. As the world becomes more complex, we need to move away from a focus on specialization and we need to cultivate generalists who can see across domains and forecast problems and their potential solutions. Adaption and lineage. Adaptive evolution improves the fit of the creatures to their environment. Fitness is often about reproduction, but it is always about persistence. Adaptive evolution occurs as individuals compete for resources. It is about all levels of descent. It is fractal and encapsulated by the term lineage. An individual and all of its descendants comprise a lineage. A species is a lineage descended from that species' most recent common ancestor. Lineages compete with each other. Genes aren't the only thing that get passed down. Culture also evolves and gets passed along. You can think of culture as biological solutions to evolutionary problems. It exists to service the genes. A lot of people are bothered by the idea that culture is evolutionary because it might mean that it is immutable, unchangeable. It is true that some things don't change, such as humans having two legs, but there is variance between individuals. Recognising the evolutionary truth that women are both more agreeable than men, on average, and more anxious, is neither a diagnosis of any individual nor an immutable fate. We are more similar than we are dissimilar. To understand the hierarchical nature of the forces at work, let's introduce the Omega Principle. The Omega Principle Epigenetic means above the genome. Culture is epigenetic in the sense it impacts the way the genome is expressed. There is a lot of confusion over this, stemming from mimetic evolution proposed by Richard Dawkins in 1976. He postulated that cultural traits spread like genes rather than as a tool of the genome to enhance fitness. The long-standing discussion regarding nature versus nurture implies a false dichotomy. 
It is all evolutionary. This can be shown through the lens of trade-offs. Culture has a big cost. The brain that can run culture is expensive in terms of energy consumption and culture will block some fitness enhancing opportunities for the individual. If it served no evolutionary value, it would be seen as parasitic on the genome. But the genome is in control, with the capacity for culture existent across a wide range of species. It is most extreme in humans, thereby showing that it is not coming at the cost of evolutionary fitness. It enhances fitness. Consider the omega principle, as defined by the following three points when trying to determine if something is an evolutionary adaption for fitness. Number one. Epigenetic regulators, such as culture, are superior to genes in that they are flexible and can adapt quickly. Number two, culture evolves to serve the genome. Number three, any expensive, long-lasting cultural trait should be presumed to be adaptive. A brief history of human lineage. All humans have language. We use tools to make new tools. We use facial expressions to communicate. We live in groups, in shelters. We watch each other and learn. We track status closely. We engage in division of labor, practice trade and reciprocity. We plan for the future. We enact rituals, dance, make music and play. How did we get here? Life started 3.5 billion years ago as a single cell. Two billion years ago, we started getting DNA and being able to pack things inside a cell, but still a single cell. There was the evolutionary beginnings of those who could create their own energy, which would make us possible. 600 million years ago, we became multicellular energy thieves, able to consume the energy of others. Animals began to appear. Some traits evolved and then disappeared. Birds flying and then some, like penguins, reversing the course. Bilateral symmetry emerged. 500 million years ago, we got a centralised heart and a brain. Soon we had skulls. 440 million years ago, fish had external skeletons. 380 million years ago, we were tetrapods, hanging out in shallow water, maybe with the hint of limbs. 300 million years ago, we became early reptiles, moving on land with lungs and an egg. 200 million years ago, we branched off from reptiles when we developed mammary glands, becoming mammals. Most mammals have gestation and live births. Lizards' side-to-side -side locomotion compresses their lungs, meaning that they cannot breathe and run at the same time. Mammals went vertical and could now run and breathe, improving our ability to hunt. 65 million years ago, the Chicxulub meteor hit Earth near the Yucatan Peninsula, blocked the sun for years and photosynthesis stopped. Extinction of all non-avian dinosaurs followed. Primates emerged during the reign of the dinosaurs and managed to survive the mass extinction. Opposable thumbs and big toes appeared. We became more visual and less olfactory. We got brainier, gestation got longer, and litter sizes fell. Parental investment lengthened. We are now a subset of monkeys. Additional nipples disappeared. Mating now occurred when the conditions were right rather than with breeding seasons. 25 to 30 million years ago, apes emerged from monkeys. 6 million years ago, we split from the ancestor of chimps and bonobos. Humans are now long-lived, learning from multiple generations, operating in social groups, developing culture, complex communications, grieving the dead, and developing a theory of mind. That is, the ability to understand that another person has a different worldview in their head. 3 million years ago, we moved down from trees, started walking more upright, our gait changed to run faster, and our vocal tract was also restructured. 200,000 years ago, we took our modern form. Humans from this era could be brought to now, put in clothes, and would be recognisable as modern humans. We are hunter-gatherers. 40,000 years ago, we are burying our dead, creating artwork, adorning ourselves, and creating music. 10 to 12,000 years ago, farming develops. 9,000 years ago, we start residing in permanent settlements. And 3,000 years ago, most of the land on Earth is modified by humans. The changes are now happening so fast to our bodies, diet and sleep that it is causing a cascade of problems for the individual and society. Ancient bodies screaming in the modern world. 
Historically, we are outliers in the human experience. We exist in an environment that is totally foreign to our ancient bodies. Consider the following modern intrusions on our ancient bodies. Carpet and corners create susceptibility to certain optical illusions. Over-reliance on chairs results in negative health outcomes. What are deodorants and perfumes doing to our interpretation of smell? Clocks to our sense of time. Internet to our sense of competence. Maps to our sense of direction. Schools to our sense of family. Once you start looking, you see the potential impacts everywhere in our modern world. Adaption, and why you shouldn't cut out your intestines. Early in the 20th century, doctors were removing appendices and the entire large intestine, figuring for some mad reason that it was not required for the flourishing of a human being. Would evolution really leave us with an organ that has a cost but no benefit? A trait should be presumed to be adaptive if, number one, it is complex. Number two, has energy or material costs varying between individuals. And number three, has persisted over evolutionary time. The appendix contains immune tissue and collects gut biota. The hypothesis is that it provides a safe house for gut flora to repopulate after a gastrointestinal illness. Humans used to suffer from this frequently. Appendicitis is almost unknown in non-industrialised countries, suggesting it may have become a liability in Western countries due to our lack of pathogens. Chesterton's fence is a useful heuristic that can be considered in this situation. It is inspired by a quote from the great writer and polymath G.K. Chesterton, which basically states, do not remove a fence until you know why it was put up in the first place. To generalise, urge caution in making changes to a system that is not fully understood. If we don't understand how we got here, we run the risk of making things far worse. Look for this in all domains of the modern world, where we try and get rid of things we don't understand. Trade-offs. There are trade-offs in everything. It's a defining characteristic of evolution. There are thousands of trade-offs within an individual organism. They come in two varieties. Allocation trade-offs involves allocating additional resources in one dimension at the expense of another. For example, larger antlers in an animal would mean a trade-off with bone density or other resources. Or design constraint trade-offs, a trait that is insensitive to supplementation Robustness is great, as is locomotor efficiency, but you can't maximise both. You can't be both the fastest and most manoeuvrable. You've never been truly hungry. Most of you have probably never been really hungry. Most creatures are hungry all the time. Populations tend to grow until there is no more surplus and then level out. Cooking detoxifies food, increases nutritional value and protects from microbial competitors. We learned over time to rot food safely so it doesn't get a chance to rot dangerously. When milk sours, it stinks. That is your body's way of telling you that you should not drink it unless you are very desperate. We go to extreme lengths to preserve it now with pasteurization, sealing and refrigeration. Cheese is a great solution to preserving milk by using cultivated bacteria that is not pathogenic to humans. It does stink though, and we are programmed to be repulsed. The smell gives us an initial sense as to whether it is safe to eat. We then need to use our second system of kin or discovery via consciousness that trains our brain that something is safe to eat. Essentially, we are remapping our system to accept smelly cheese. Oh, and beer tastes great because it essentially carries the nutrition of bread. Many modern solvents trick our evolved sense-making apparatus and smell good, despite the fact that they are toxic. The damage is often done as soon as we smell these modern chemicals. Think nail polish, magic markers and gasoline. We cannot smell natural gas or propane because our ancestors never encountered this as a hazard. There is no natural alarm of the disgust system so humans have had to add a smell to it so we can sense and be alarmed by it. We come equipped to smell a whole bunch of stuff and know intuitively what is good and bad. We are changing things so fast and hacking our senses so that they cannot remap fast enough to prevent damage. So what to do next? Be sceptical of novel solutions to ancient problems. Recognise the logic of trade-offs and work with them. Become someone who recognises patterns about yourself. Observe and experiment on yourself honestly. Persist and look for the signal in the noise. Look out for Chesterton's fence in all domains. Don't get rid of something simply because you don't know what it does.
medicine and the human machine. The human body cannot be treated as a machine, with simple switches that can be flicked by modern drugs. This is, however, how the medical system currently tries to treat sick humans. The quick treatment of the vast majority of medical issues with drugs rather than diagnosis cripples the medical system to even do diagnosis well. It also pollutes the data stream. Who is actually sick and from what? What is a side effect and what isn't? Following directions from the medical establishment when the people giving the directions have no idea is neither honourable or smart. The modern medical system does not take up an evolutionary perspective. Anything with a simple switch that medication acts on would have been solved by selection if it were possible without unacceptable trade-offs, and if the problem really was a problem. Combined with novel inputs from diet, simple and wrong answers on the internet and market forces, people feel confused, unseen, and struggle to make sense of themselves as they jump between the silos of doctors and specialists. Don't fall to reductionism. Complex systems cannot be reduced to a few observations and thereby easily solved. Reductionism tends to bite the reducer. Modern medicine is reductionist and is revealed in the concept of scientism. Scientism was identified by Frederick Hayek as the methods and language of science used in unscientific ways. If something can be counted, it is, and further analysis is foregone. Once we have a proxy for a thing, we think we know the thing. The mistake of scientism is further compounded by imagining we are simple machines. It is an engineer's approach to biology. We look for metrics and then we make it the metric for the system. Examples of this are counting calories, as if all calories are equal, and the immediate application of pharmaceuticals for almost any health complaint. We are not machines. We are embodied beings with feedback between brain, body, hormone and mood. Our mechanisms are not simple, isolated switches. Moving your body and breaking a sweat is a better treatment for mood disorders as a first step. Engaging in activities that combine strength, flexibility and cardiovascular will help regulate your body better. Also, we are all distinct. Cutting open 10 of the same animals will reveal significant variation within a species. Consider this when trying to determine what works for you. Consider the risks of reductionism as we consume. The single molecule extracted is not the same as the whole. We often mistake the effect for our understanding of the effect. Hubris and technical capacity has us recreating this error over and over. Fluoride in the drinking water, neurotoxicity, shelf-stable foods, autism, and GMOs. Think you've found a magic bullet? Look harder for the hidden costs. Avoid the shelf-stable food in the middle of the supermarket. Propionic acid, PPA, is added to the processed food to extend shelf life. When this is presented in utero, it appears to be linked to an increase in diagnosis of autism. We've all been told for decades to cover up to protect ourselves from the sun. Reduced sun exposure has now been linked to an increase in blood pressure, which leads to an increase in the risk of heart disease and stroke. A study on Swedish women found non-smokers who avoided sun exposure had a life expectancy similar to smokers in the highest sun exposure group, indicating that avoidance of sun exposure is a risk factor for death of a similar magnitude as smoking. The problem highlighted is the over-application of reductionism. Reductionism worked for antibiotics and vaccines and saved millions of lives, but now we're overgeneralized and overused antibiotics, resulting in a widespread lack of healthy microbiomes. Who should I believe? We crave simplicity in this hyper-novel world. We want to be able to set and forget. We rely on culture to make decisions for us rather than consciousness because it is too much effort, in general, to make everything conscious. So what to do next? Listen to your body, move your body every day with dynamic exercises, spend time in uncontrolled nature, be barefoot, do it, your feet will thank you. Resist pharmaceutical solutions if you can. Check your diet, sleep patterns, exercise routine and sun exposure first. Look out for mismatched diseases that represent an inconsistency between your ancient body and your current life. Now let's take a break. Head outside and scream at our phones. That is enough for today. Next post will cover issues with modern food, sleep, sex and parenthood. If you've enjoyed this so far, go get the book. Read it and share it with your friends. Remember this is just a sketch to be used as a memory aid for committing the book to memory. The real gold is in the book. 
That's how I use it anyway. If you've got any questions on this book or suggestions for any books you'd like to see notes on, hit me up on Twitter at the David Hart. To read the writing behind this podcast, subscribe on Substack. Connect with me on Twitter. And if you think this thing is worth anything, consider supporting me on Patreon. Thanks for listening. Thank you.